My name's Joseph Toscano. I'm the Secretary for Public Interest before Corporate Interest. It's the second last day of summer in Melbourne. We are at the Fairfield Park Boathouse, which was established in 1906. And generations of people living in this area, before and after colonisation, have come to this beautiful part of Melbourne. It's only about five kilometres from the Melbourne CBD and on weekends this park is full of people, full of life. And it's great to be here on a weekday. And I think if you need a bit of peace and quiet and you're sick of the TV, social media is giving you, irritating you, come down here and sit here with the uh, wildlife next to the river. doesn't cost you anything. Bring your own lunch, bring a drink just relax. I think people have forgotten how important it is to relax in this day and age of uh, 24 hour noise, white noise. Now we're here to talk about climate change, which I think you think would be a bit of ironical, wouldn't you? This is like paradise on earth. You've got the river, the birds, the trees, the blue sky. You've got people enjoying themselves at the boathouse, having a, a light uh, afternoon uh, lunch and we're here to talk about human induced climate change because maybe in 50 years time this won't be here and that's what we need to think about well the rest of the world has accepted climate change as a reality because of the political paralysis in this country because of the fact that the government and the opposition to a lesser degree are hostages to the mining industry uh, climate change is still a debatable issue in this country when everybody else has accepted it's a reality. We're still debating whether it's a reality and even the government currently is making these little noises that it could be a reality. Now look, I travel to Central Australia by car, not four wheel drive, just a normal boring little car every three to four years because I like the solitude. And I usually do it at the hottest time of the year, at the end of the year, at the beginning of the next year. And this year, although I've been travelling to Central Australia now for over 40 years, was the worst I have ever seen it in terms of drought. Not just your one in a hundred year drought, but a drought which is really ripping the soul and the productivity of the land. Apart from the occasional artesian bull and a few cows, mangy cows, uh, around that artesian bull, no kangaroos, no wildlife, no trees, and hundreds, literally hundreds of creeks and tributaries and rivers that have run completely dry. Lake Eyre, just a salt pan. That was at the end of uh, 2018. It could be different as the water from the floods come down into Lake Eyre. So, how do you explain climate change? Now look, I'm a simple person, just like you, because if you uh, weren't simple, you wouldn't be listening to a simple man talk about a simple issue. Because there's nothing complex about climate change. Everybody thinks climate change is a complex thing, and you need all these scientific results, you need to do this, you need to do that, and you need to look at these papers, and you need to you know, win this argument. I'll give you an example. I'm gonna talk about the Joe Toscano climate change experiment because I'm a little bit of a uh, sadist. Remember when you were a kid and you got a little dome, a little plastic dome or a glass dome and under that plastic or glass dome you put in a few mice and a bit of shrubbery and you let them go for it. What do mice do? If you pick the right sexes, they breed. They breed. And that shrubbery soon disappears. And there are so many mice under that glass dome, they start attacking each other because there's no food. And you can see the stress and the anxiety and the anger and the destruction of that community. Now, planet Earth is a glass dome. We have a thin stratosphere and atmosphere. Thin, very thin. And within that stratosphere atmosphere, we have this globe. Molten lava inside, earth outside. And on this globe we have seven billion people. Beyond the stratosphere we have space. 
just space. Nothing else, no air, no oxygen, space. So we are basically living in a dome as a species. And when we went out of Africa about 80, 90 thousand years ago, there were 2,000 of us. Now there are 7 billion of us. And our needs are much more complex. We've manufactured all these needs which need energy, which needs, needs to be produced, which has been produced for the last 200 years using coal. So if you've got a stratosphere, an increasing population, limited resources, what do you think happens? We start to pollute our dome. And that's what climate change is. As we start to pollute our dome, the temperature rises. As the temperature rises, the water evaporates. As the water evaporates, the trees die. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow process. You don't notice. You all know about the analogy of the toad in the water, or the frog in the water, who only at the last at the boiling point notices that it's going to die and that's what we've been doing we have four major issues regarding climate change we have limited resources they're finite they're not infinite it doesn't matter how many scientific innovations are made we have finite resources on planet earth and unless we go to the moon or mars or jupiter or who knows where we have finite resources we do have scientific methods of uh, extending the life of those resources but the, the resources are finite. Population growth is growing rapidly. People don't die in their 30s. We have made great strides in terms of human health and people will be living into their hundreds, 100, 110. We have about 5% of the population reaching that age within the next decade because of improvements in nutrition, improvements in sanitation, improvements in medication, improvement in healthcare and improvement in the way you know people live their lifestyle. So we have seven billion people and in 20 years we'll have nine billion people with finite resources. Now all these people do things, they shit. They have cows that shit. We have carbon dioxide emissions are growing rapidly. These emissions are contained within the stratosphere. As the climate temperature increases, variations in climate occur. We have floods, we have cyclones, we have droughts, we have pouring rain. And what, if you're old enough, what you've noticed in Australia is, I remember when I first came to Melbourne in 1971, we had winters. Winters, that's right. Cold, bitterly cold winters. We don't have winters anymore. It's lucky if we have an autumn. And I remember that when I first came to Melbourne from Queensland, when I used to be in Queensland, I'd have sweat running down my back in these pre-air conditioning days when you relied on fans. But when you came to Melbourne, there was no sweat running down your back. In summer, things have changed. Things are changing, and they're changing very rapidly. So I'm not going to kind of pontificate about what we need to do. We know what we need to do. And the tragedy is that we are one of the countries which is best situated to tackle this problem tomorrow. But unfortunately, because of entrenched interests in the coal industry and the mining industry and all the assorted paraphernalia that goes with them, the assorted businesses, they put extraordinary pressures on our political representatives who are now dancing to their tune, who are trying to, trying to delay what's going to happen. It's a little bit like tobacco smoking and lung cancer. It took decades before, although we had the knowledge, before enough pressure was placed on tobacco companies to actually mitigate the damage they were causing. Not eradicated, but mitigated. So we've got the situation now where you've got this beautiful park, these beautiful animals, this beautiful afternoon, wonderful sunshine. But our grandchildren may not enjoy this. They may be living in domes in a dome in order to survive. Think about it. A dome within a dome to survive. We'll have to cull the human race. We'll have to decide who's worth saving. And these are decisions which will be made for us 
if we don't tackle this issue today. It's no accident there's all this research going to space travel. Because people know that eventually the only way we're going to survive as a race is if we actually go outside this planet and destroy other planets for generations to come. That's why there's all this research into space travel. So, as I said, Australia is brilliantly situated. We have an abundance of sunshine. Solar farms are easy and inexpensive to build. If we had the political will within 10 years, we could change over from a coal-based economy to a solar and wind and hydro-driven economy. We have masses of land. We have huge coastlines, tens of thousands of kilometres of coastline. We have the ability to create energy to sustain us as a society. But we don't see this occurring because of entrenched interests. And the dilemma is that while we think that what matters is the price of the electricity bill at the end of three months or two months in your gas bill, and that politicians play on that, then we've got a big issue in this country. Because although we may only produce 3% of the world's emissions, per head of population, we are the biggest carbon emitters on the planet. On the planet. So we can change what's happening. It's about applying pressure. It's applying political pressure it's applying social pressure, it's applying cultural pressure. Because paradoxically, while we have a system which is a privatised energy system, it's all about creating ever increasing profits for your major shareholders. So what we need to do is move away from the privatised model, whether it's a solar privatised model, wind privatised model, coal privatised model, and move to a model where energy, which is an essential element of any society, is actually created by the state. And that way we can make huge changes in direction quickly, because we don't have to worry about the profit motive. All our representatives have to worry about is the health and safety of the people they represent, not the profits of those who own those uh, instruments which create energy. So we have a great deal to do in the future. And unless you personally take up this particular struggle, then you will find that the lives of your children and their children and your friends and their friends and your work colleagues and their work colleagues will become unbearable. And we will have the same problem those mice had in that dome. We will turn on each other. I'll be looking at you. Actually, you'll be looking at me because of my size as a potential food source. I know it sounds ridiculous, but if you look at human history and you look at how we deal with natural disasters and how we tend to survive, I can imagine a society in 50 years' time where be decisions will be made to cull segments of the population because they're no longer useful. They're no longer productive, or people, other people think they're not useful or productive. And those of you who've seen that little movie, Soylent Green, just need to look at that again. It wasn't much of a movie, but when it was made 35 years ago, the concept was revolutionary. The fact that we cannibalise each other in order to survive. It's happened before and will happen again. But we don't have to go down that direction. This is not a... This is not a YouTube about doom and gloom. If I believed that nothing could change, I wouldn't be here. I'd be sitting down, I'd be patting the ducks, because you don't feed them, you know, because they're wild ducks. Well, these are semi-wild. I'd be enjoying a beer down at the boathouse. Maybe I'd get in a boat and get somebody else to row me up and down the Yarra, because, you know, I'm not really equipped to do that type of thing. Look at these hands. How could you imagine me rowing a boat? But the thing is, it's really, it doesn't have to be this way. Things can change. And change does not just come from individual action. Change comes from political decisions. And to see thousands of school children come out on the streets last year to say, hey, 
you've forgotten about us. This is our future. It's our planet. You need to do something about it. It's time that you and I took this very seriously and did something about it. If we don't, well, I don't care. I'm old. I'll be dead soon, you know. But again, if I've got kids, grandkids, and you've got kids and grandkids and friends and young friends, well, maybe you'd like to think about them instead of your retirement in the Bahamas. All the best, and remember, the Joe Toscano theory of climate change. If you can debunk it, let me know. I'll give you everything that's in my pocket, five cents.